Okay, we're going to formally start the session. Thank you very much for joining us here at this year's Crawford Australian Leadership Forum. Um, I've been lucky enough to come to almost all of the Crawford uh, forums and each year they're one of my favourite things on the, uh, on the timeline. Um, I'm sorry that this year we're not meeting in person. Um, that's, again, one of the fun things. But we're going to try today in this session, particularly as it's the last session um, before the, the final wrap up, to make this as interactive as possible. So please do treat it like being in the room with others who are fascinated by the same issues that you're fascinated by. And we're going to try to make it as interactive as we can. Now, uh, my name is Melissa Conley Tyler. I'm the program lead of the Asia Pacific Development, Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue. Um, this session is looking at, uh, at multilateralism and the rules based order. And we have a fantastic panel with us today. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, it's a good moment to actually think about Indigenous knowledge on international relations. Um, the continent of Australia, um, the same size as Western Europe or you know, the main core of China, um, is a place where the differences between different nations, between language and cultural groups, have been managed very successfully without the sort of large scale conflict that we've seen in other parts of the world. Um, the Indigenous knowledge on how that was achieved is something that I think we could all learn from. And it might help us be perhaps a little less fatalistic about the relationship between modern nations in the world, uh, which we're often inclined to see through a realm of um, uh, inevitable conflict. Now, multilateralism and the rules-based orders are a way that we try to deal with some of what we see as that inherent anarchy. Uh, but at this point, there's a lot of concern about what's happening with the rules-based international order and with multilateralism. So to try to tease out those issues for us, um, we have a fantastic panel with us today. So uh, from the Australian government side, we have Caroline Miller, who's Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Caroline, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, from Singapore, we have Sarah Teo from the Nanyang Technological University. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm glad to be here and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, from beachside Sydney, as we can see, we have Hung Wang, who's a professor of Chinese International Economic and Business Law at the University of New South Wales. Thank you for joining us, Hung. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great to be here. Look forward to more discussion. Thank you. And we have Thomas Wright from Brookings Institution. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Thank you. It's great to be with you all. So I'm going to start off with the big question. So this rules-based international order, multilateralism, is it broken? Tom. Um, it depends what you mean by it, but I think it, it, it fundamentally doesn't work in the way that it used to, mainly because I think of great power rivalry. So you increasingly have a constellation led by sort of the US and other democracies on the one hand, and a constellation sort of led by China on the other, and they're heavily interdependent. They have to work together, but they have very different sort of geopolitical interests and worldviews. And that I think is the novel you know, development that really means the multilateral order as it exists now is not what it used to be. Not what it used to be. Um, Sarah. Um, well, I mean, I don't think the rules based on multilateral order is broken per se, but I would say that, I mean, it has always been, it has been contested for, for the last few decades. Um, and I think it is evolving uh, because I think for all we talk about the rules-based order, order being something that, um, uh, I guess, triumphs over overall power or coercion, I don't think we can escape power dynamics when, when, we, when it comes to talking about the rules-based order. Okay, not broken, but contested. Hung. I think it's being, uh, I'm not sure whether it's being uh, broken, but I think the multinationalism face serious challenges. We have to manage that carefully. And also another side, we see more engagement or dynamics in at the regional level among the like-minded heads. 
but also at a really natural uh, level, as we see, for example, at in the tension uh, in area like trade. Thank you. And for our last word, Caroline. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I absolutely agree with Tom that geostrategic competition is playing out not always very helpfully in the multilateral system as elsewhere. But, it, but I'm, I'm not sure there ever was a halcyon era. If you think about it, with the exception of the decade after the end of the Cold War, when the UN and the multilateral system finally looked like it was able to, to uh, fulfil its purpose, the sort of fractures we see now and in different forms have been there really since the beginning. Um, and, and also, and again, this I think also reflects Tom's point, it's not a monolithic system. We're talking about a vast array of international treaties, institutions, UN specialised agencies, funds and programmes, some of which are no longer fit for purpose, some of which are in need of serious reform, some of which are very politically riven, but many of which continue to do extremely practical, useful things, um, you know, through delivery of services, and humanitarian assistance, standards governing, law of the sea or telecommunications, whatever. So I think it's a, it's a very simple question for a very complex subject. Mm -hmm. Well, I might go back to Tom. I think you're the, the most pessimistic that it didn't, doesn't work how it used to. From a US perspective, um, what are you seeing as this huge alteration um, in the system? Well, let's just take the pandemic. You know, we have a, a threat to all of humanity that emerges quite quickly. Uh, it's the very definition of a shared problem that we all sort of agree upon. Over the last 17 years after SARS, there were numerous reforms to the multilateral system, numerous reforms inside China to make sure the response the next time it happened was more transparent, cooperative and rapid. And when COVID hit, like literally none of that mattered, right? And there was no cooperation. We had many more institutions now than we had in 2018, 2019. There was virtually no more cooperation now than there was a hundred years ago. China's reaction was basically the same or worse than it was in SARS in terms of cooperation with the international community. The US reaction under Trump was you know, to pull out of the WHO in the middle of a pandemic and Europe and others were really unable to fill the vacuum. So I don't know how anyone could look at that and say, you know, that's not broken. Now the question is why? I, I would argue the primary reason there is a combination of geopolitical rivalry and nationalism that caused us to regress. And I think the what we need to do going forward is accept that as a reality and try to figure out how to deal with these problems if the world remains broken, right? What do we do if we have these types of regimes or governments around the world? Um, but it, it clearly, you know, clearly there was a regression there. And if it doesn't work in something like pandemics, then you know what what are we what are we talking about? Like because that that is what it's meant to do, right? It, it's meant to be on things that we do actually agree are a problem that it will be effective, but it wasn't effective and it's still not effective even as we're living this in real time. Mm. Well, I, I suppose part of the problem is COVID itself was not neutral. There was a huge blame game and still is a huge blame game between the US and China on the origins of COVID and how it was handled. Um, so can I go to you, Hung? Um, we're talking about contestation as being a you know, huge challenge to the international order. Um, tell us more from China's perspective, what that looks like. Yeah, I think it's been, uh, China has been quite different from what happened in the past being uh, you know, one of the top two major economy. And also China also wants to have a stronger role in international governance, including you know, rule making uh, of the China preferred or China style rules. And, and also in the recent years, we see the Belt and Road Initiative with China uh, led, you know, unprecedented large scale uh, movements. So, um, so you see that actually uh, it's natural to see those kind of tension between US and China, because you see China kind of try to upload, you know, the China uh, style practice, you know, technical standards. Now recently also about central bank digital currency. And another side, you see the US, for example, uh, uh, being the, you know, pre-existing uh, uh, superpower who has been dominated uh, in large, to large extent, the rule making. So you see the tension you know, between you know China shifting from in the WTXH stage downloading to now kind of uploading their practice, which will also affect say you know for example pre-existing rules of the US, and and also 
uh, that it helps explain what we see, what I call China trying to synactively reshaping, you know, international governance through institutional development like AIB, you know, through the uh, technical uh, uh, standards along the BRI, you know, more recently digital yuan, you know, China tried to be the first major economy issue, digital currency. Another side you see, uh, you know, other countries like the US also try to respond to China's practice, you know, like they also thinking of digital dollar as another example. It's different from what happened in the past where China responded to the US behavior. And what happened at the end of the day is that, you know, US and China, for example, are much narrower engagement than before. So what I call a uh, synactive engagement, you can see that in the Trump era, when they have say, you know, US-China trade deal is much narrower than our free trade agreements. And it's much more technical because it's hard for them to, to cooperate on in only in very except, uh, minor, you know, a uh, small number area like climate change, but we'll see how they will proceed on. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and Sarah, I mean, how is this being seen in the region? You know, is this seen as this competition, this breaking down of this rules-based international order? Well, I think um, the developments are being watched with some concern, especially in Southeast Asia, um, because for, for many of or most Southeast Asian states, you know, they are small and medium-sized states. And in that sense, uh, a working or functional rules-based multilateral order is generally better than an order that um, is based on raw power or coercion or even the threat of coercion. So when it comes to ASEAN especially, I think I see two kinds of related concerns. Um, you know, as we know, since the early 1990s, ASEAN has always espoused this kind of um, big inclusive multilateralism that brings together a range of powers to the same table, right? Whether they are like-minded uh, or not. So this is what ASEAN regards as being in its best interest for the past few decades. And ASEAN itself has worked very hard to be at the center or the hub of this multilateral order. So the two concerns I see here, um, um, given increasing geostrategic competition and, and the worries about multilateralism, is that I think firstly, there is a concern that ASEAN-type multilateralism is being regarded or may be regarded as increasingly irrelevant. Um, you know, multilateralism potentially dividing into exclusive or like-minded coalitions um, that, that are built around the major powers. So that is, you know, fundamentally, I think it, it goes against what ASEAN has, has always espoused. Um, the second concern um, is that, you know, in some event, although I think it is quite unlikely, but I think the, the risk, there's a small risk uh, in the sense that the major powers would become, I guess, too committed to ASEAN uh, to the extent that ASEAN then becomes a platform for, for Sino-US rivalry, which is also not good for ASEAN. Um, because that will eventually mean that the pressure on ASEAN to pick a side will increase. So I think the two concerns, they do seem a bit contradictory. Um, so ultimately, I think it's a fine line to balance between, you know, continuing to keep the major powers' interests on the one hand in that sort of multilateralism, but ensuring that, that the reins of control still remains very much uh, in the hands of, of the smaller or the medium-sized states. Mm. Well, Caroline, uh, what Sarah said sounds pretty familiar, wanting a functional order rather than threats of coercion. Australia is very keen on that. But um, we, we've been talking a lot about rules-based international order in Australian discourse. Um, how do you contrast it with multilateralism? Are they both in the same sort of trouble or do you see differences? I'm never quite sure what people mean when they try and make a difference between the rules-based order and, and multilateralism, in a sense. I mean, you're looking, again, at systems of treaties and multilateral international organizations or the, the rules that underpin the multilateral system. So I'm never, I'm never I, it always seems a little bit of an academic argument to me. Um, I've never quite understood that, that, that distinction. Um, but basically, I think for a middle power like Australia, we have no choice but to work very constructively with other countries to build coalitions of interest to, to, to support our objectives. So the so the, a sort of a stable regional and global order underpinned by liberal democratic values is more important to us now than ever before. But I think it's it's very hard to do. Uh, and it's, it's harder now perhaps than it was a few years ago. Um, I think one of the things that Australia has traditionally been very good at is this building of cross-group co coalitions. It's partly because of the combination of our history and our geography, the kind of culture that we are, the society that we are and where we live. And we've been able to bridge some of those divides, I think, across development and politics um, quite quite well over many years. So when I look at where we are now, I see us drawing on those strengths in a more contested and difficult environment to take forward our interests. 
uh, one other point I'd make is that you know people can get very cynical about the multilateral system, or they can get right, at times can be very idealistic about it. I don't think either of those two things are helpful. I think you need a very pragmatic approach to look at how you pursue your national interests, and the multilateral system or the rules-based order is a vector for pursuing those interests and a very important one. Well, I think we've got some of our first uh, ideas that I want our audience to get interested in. So let's get some discussion happening. The Q&A is open at all times. And I'd love as you hear something that you want to respond to, that you want to analyse further for you to start to put in there. Um, if you'd like uh, to be called upon, you can write live next to that. And I will then call upon you and we can start having conversation. If as I often do, you're having a bad hair day, your camera isn't working, just put not live and then I'll be your voice and I will put that question in. So please do start. Looking at the people in the room, I know you've got a lot to contribute to these discussions. Start putting into the Q&A. Um, so that question on rules-based international order and multilateralism, that's certainly one people might want to get started on. Um, I think if I was going to respond on that, Carolyn, I'd say, um, Someone who sees a difference between those two is China. And so uh, China has said very explicitly that it's absolutely supportive of multilateralism by what it means, the UN system universally based, but it's not supportive of what it's hearing as when people are using the words rules-based order, which it sees as code for American-led rules-based order. So it's interesting even that that the way that that's been used rhetorically. Um, Peng, do you want to come in on that at all, on uh, China's views between, between uh, US-led order and multilateralism? Yeah, I think it's been a um, different, different understanding um, on China and also uh, US, for example, and actually the, shows the difficulty of uh, uh, engagement and lack of common language. Uh, let alone, you know, first engagement on um, sensitive on um, all regulatory issues like, you know, data regulations, you know, issue like, you know, uh, epidemics, you know, and and, the, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what do we see that actually in those kind of issues, it analyzes it, the different uh, model, um, you know, two countries live with, you know, US one or the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, uh, governance model uh, internally. And also um, that also explains that they are down the track uh, we would like to see more, um, you know, difficulties or dynamics in, in those kind of engagement because these two major economies can have more difficulty to reach a consensus that makes it more difficult to set more, to provide more predictability uh, for businesses, you know, for, uh, for the NGOs and for other stakeholders. Um, so I think it's been likely that they're, they're, they're able to agree on those common interest area like climate change, but it's much more difficult to see uh, common grounds in area like subsidies, you know, uh, data, uh, technology, uh, and and also competition, and that are this uh, sensitive issue for China. I think the interest will seem to be that they they want to benefit from the WTO, for example, multilateralism in terms of market access, you know, uh, because that's good for China's exports, you know, of products and and so on and so forth. Another side, China hesitated to take more stringent uh, rules, regulatory disciplines. So if you look at China's, uh, for example, free trade agreements, China usually pref uh, you know, prefer WTO-based rules, but when you go to new area like environment and, and uh, neighbor issues has been uh, touched upon, and the rules are quite general, even if they have some new issues get involved. So there could be a, a potential uh, issues down the track to see how to find a common ground. Understood. Well, Tom, you won't be surprised. I'd like to come to you on this. So around that, that issue on rules-based order, American-led order versus multilateralism, um, what, what is it the US is most worried about out of these? Well, look, the, the, the multilateralism system and the rules-based order system and the US-led order, they're all interchangeable, right? Because the reality is that they were set up you know, either after World War II at the end of the Cold War, and it reflects, it inherently reflects a set of, you know, relatively liberal sort of values and, 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 and a relatively liberal, you know, status quo that was in place. And, you know, when China talks about sort of a UN system, obviously it has a veto on the UN Security Council and would like to redefine some of those norms, but it's basically challenging 
you know, that norm set internationally uh, to make the world safe for, for the CCP, right, for its regime type, which is probably what you would expect them to do sort of in that situation. But it does fundamentally change, you know, the world that we're living in, because it means that those sort of norms and institutions, you know, and organizations that we sort of took for granted and that status quo that we sort of took for granted amongst the major powers or, you know, amongst most, you know, countries outside of a, of a few areas that were always sort of unstable, like the, like the Middle East, um, you know, that that is now, you know, contested. In terms of your direct question, what is the US worried about? I think the US is worried about a world in which, um, you know, frankly put, I think a world in which it no longer leads and China leads because then the system will reflect sort of, a, a, you know, the CCP's interests and its sort of interpretation of values. Um, but I would say Which if you push different. further, you know, Americans probably would be okay if they were replaced by, you know, other liberal powers, right? If, if you saw the U.S. withdrawing and, you know, you know, democratic Asia and the EU and the UK emerged and took on more, I think there will be a, a very relaxed sort of view about that, right? There might be some sort of problems on the margin, but it'd be pretty relaxed. I think the real problem is this alternative vision that's out there that is now I think you know undeniable and so that's the you know that's the problem there is no objective sort of multilateral system that China is actually in favor of and they're just against alliances right they have a I think a very different way of looking at this and you know I think we see that playing out pretty much every day particularly in Australia obviously but in many other places also you know this contest is is unfolding. Mm. Yeah, so um, it's clear that, you know, what might follow would be based on different non-liberal norms, and that's a very uncomfortable place for the US not to be top dog anymore. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we're getting lots of questions, and I think I, I really should get some of them talking. So um, I've got a couple that uh, have come in not live. So the first um, is from Michael Wadley. Um, He's thanking you, Tom, for coming out in your time zone, which we do appreciate. Um, if there's to be a reorganisation of multilateralism, isn't the solution to ask what can be done with China post Anchorage, assuming there is a place for a so-called non-liberal democratic system? Yeah, look, I, I think we ought to try to work with China on, on a lot of different things. You know, it's pretty hard to do that. I mean, the U.S. sent its number two diplomat to the State Department not that long ago and found it very difficult even to get appropriate meetings, right? So it, it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to get outcomes, um, as we're seeing on the, on the pandemic and on COVID. But I think we ought to continue and we ought to make every effort to work on, you know, to work on shared interests. But the issue that people have to confront, which they're, I think, keen to sort of generally avoid is, if we look at the empirical track record of that engagement, and we acknowledge that it's unlikely to come up to what we need, and clearly cooperation with China did not yield what we needed on the pandemic. And I wouldn't just talk about the US and China here, look at the EU and China, look at the WHO and China, um, you know, it didn't yield what we needed it to yield. So what do we do then? Like what's our backup plan? If we're not getting cooperation on critical issues of shared interest, what's our backup plan? And that I think is, is key. So we absolutely need to engage in global institutions. We absolutely need to sincerely and really try to work with China. And we also need to be prepared to work with others as well when those global efforts aren't, aren't satisfactory. And I think the pandemic is you know, exhibit A in, in, in that. But I wanted to go to Sarah. Um, one of the things you've written a lot on is unilateralism as an alternative to you know, some of the problems in the multilateral system. Would you like to tell us more about what you're seeing happening with that growth of unilateralism in the region? I'm um, sure. Um, so, well, I guess from, again, from this region, uh, minilateralism has always kind of existed. You know, we have, we have had um, uh, the six party talks, uh, smaller functional groupings like um, the Malacca Streets patrols that 
originally involved uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. And of course, when, when the Indian Ocean tsunami happened in the mid 2000s, there was also kind of the original Quad countries that got together to provide assistance and aid. Um, and those have those minilateral, smaller initiatives have always existed alongside um, the bigger multilateral uh, cooperation. Um, but what I, what I think you know is happening today is that uh, these minilateral initiatives are taking on a more strategic dimension, especially when it, in in the in the context of Sino-US rivalry. Um, and there's a growth of minilateral platforms, I think, uh, for two reasons. One is uh, you know, the perceived, whether rightly or not, ineffectiveness of multilateralism in addressing, you know, very critical questions um, for the region. And the second is kind of um, this sense that under, especially under the previous Trump administration, um, the US may not be as committed uh, uh, to this region as it has in the past. And so I think regional countries are getting together uh, in, in small groups to kind of advance their own collective interests. Um, but the worry I think for this region is that eventually, you know, with the Quad and with this potential idea of a Quad Plus, um, minilateralism is going to grow bigger into multilateralism. And then we are going to see kind of different spheres of multilateralism. That's a term to use, right? One led by the US and, and one led by China. And again, I mean, not to keep coming back to ASEAN, but you know, where does that then leave ASEAN? Because if, if the multilateral uh, role is taken away from ASEAN and is being run by China versus the US, basically, you know, ASEAN is, is going to become increasingly irrelevant or, or you know, its function is, is gone. So I think the increasing minilateralism in this region would be something to watch. Um, so not just in terms of what it means for the multilateral architecture, but also in terms of what these minilateral coalitions are doing, right? If we look at the Quad, for example, it has, I think, three working groups now on, on vaccines, on critical and uh, technologies, and the last one, I think, on climate change. Um, but as far as I know, I think that the vaccine working group has run into problems with India. I'm, I'm not sure where, where the status of, of that cooperation is now. Um, you know, but I think what would be important to watch is what kind of substantive outcomes uh, eventually result from such minilateral cooperation. Well, thank you. Well, I haven't seen another new question come in. Susan, I'm coming to yours at the end because it's a really positive one. I love it. Um, what I might do then is, is go to Tom. I mean, uh, Sarah just raised that issue of US commitment to the region and US commitment to the rules-based international order. Um, if we'd been having this talk a few years ago, we would have been talking about the Trump administration also as a threat to the rules-based international order for a range of reasons. Um, this comes down to a domestic politics question for the US. I mean, how confident can the region be that the forces that favour multilateralism um, and a rules-based international order will win the battle of domestic politics in the US? And I, I know you've written that it's more difficult now for leaders who favour multilateralism to mobilise support. Can you, you give us a bit more on that domestic US angle? Look, I, I think that the, the differences are very real obviously between the parties and also, uh, you know, Trump adds a unique sort of wild card to the mix in terms of his attitude, you know, on all of this. Um, so I think that's a very fair question. And obviously, you know, many of us are making the case in favor of multilateralism and leadership. It's not guaranteed that that will continue. I would say though that, you know, even the Trump administration, you know, you know did, sort of deepen cooperation, you know, in the quad, did try to deepen America's presence in Asia, wouldn't quite have done it how I would have liked to see it done, but I think there was sort of a commitment there. And while they were resistant to multilateralism, the UN and the WHO, you know, even there, there were sort of the bones of sort of a, a, a strategy for engaging Asia. So I would say that in terms of Asia's role in America's um, foreign policy, that's probably the, the region with the most support for engagement. <laughs> you know, Europe is more, 
is, is more divisive now. There's the, the, the parties are more divided. Politics is more divided about America's role in Europe, obviously in the Middle East. The one where there's most agreement on is Asia. There's still a lot of issues there to be resolved. Um, but I think the picture is maybe, you know, a little bit brighter than, um, you know, than in other aspects of US foreign policy. Now I'm going to go to, okay, well, I'm going to finish up with our question, our last question, which is about repair and renewal, which I understand is the overall topic of the whole Crawford Forum. Um, it's been a very interesting couple of years for pretty much everyone involved in public policy in all areas. Um, and it's been a very interesting couple of years on multilateralism in the rules-based international order. So whether you think it's broken or whether you think it's mulling along about as it ever did, what, what suggestions do you have for repair and renewal of that multilateral and rules-based system? So I might start with you, Thomas, and we'll go around. Sure. You know, I, I think um, we ought to try for pretty broad-based reforms. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I think we also need to be ready, you know, to act with like-minded countries, you know, if those reforms aren't forthcoming. And I just go back to the pandemic, which is obviously what we're dealing with now, but there's absolutely no reason why like-minded countries can't provide more you know, vaccines, do more on diagnostics and testing, more on pandemic preparedness than is required under the IHRs and the WHO. You know, there's no reason that a group of like-minded can't adhere to higher standards of transparency, cooperation and coordination at a time of, you know, a pandemic, at a future epidemic or pandemic. So those are ways in which I think, you know, we could, we could do more even if the global system you know, doesn't do as much as we would like. And that is reinforcing the global system. It's not undermining it. Uh, so I think we need to be ready to take on a greater share of the burden if we believe, as I think is the case, that these uh, threats and challenges are you know, very severe. So that's what I mean, that we need a backup plan and we also need to be willing to be bold and ambitious. And while a lot has been done, and I agree with Caroline on this, you know, we have seen improvements on, you know, providing vaccines, we're still falling far short of what is needed. And so there's still a lot of scope there for us to do more. And we don't need to wait for, you know, everyone else to get there to do that. You can show leadership right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, Hung? Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted also to add that um, I think multilateralism uh, uh, need to adapt to the new dynamics we're facing. And I would like, to, and also to pro, try their best to promote good governance, although we face a lot of challenges. Uh, one thing I want to say is that multilateralism is crucial and also has its own advantages. So, for example, for dispute settlement, it's very difficult to see, you know, bilateral free trade agreements or arrangements where you, you initiate a case against another, you know, particular larger power or even at a more uh, regional level. But I think as we see, for example, double CO, uh, there are much more, uh, many more cases has been brought. And also I think multinationalism has their own in, uh, advantage of uh, promoting the engagement, you know, which is the standard setting. You know, uh, it's a standard uh, uh, context where the countries will engage with each other, even if they have a difficult, uh, you know, relationship. And, and even for negotiation perspective, you know, besides the uh, dispute settlement, uh, is you can negotiate for plurinatural agreements. You know, like-minded countries can try to force their own, you know, consensus. So I think that's uh, it's crucial to have multilateralism, and we just try our best and to make sure that they promote uh, good governance as much as we can. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just put up three, I guess, three points. Um, so first, would in terms of repair and renewal, um, would be to continue engaging with rising powers. Of course, I mean, not just China, but also others like India. Uh, it will be challenging, but I think it's necessary if we are talking about a more inclusive order. Um, second, I think, I mean, thank you, Caroline, for, for responding to that. Um, so my second uh, suggestion would be to kind of look at a uh, function of minilateralism as a complementary to multilateralism, right? To kind of get things moving uh, among smaller groups first before, before going bigger. And third would be, I think it's a good opportunity for, for middle powers to step up and manage this, given that, you know, their interest in a multilateral rules-based order, as we've heard throughout this session, um, 
is you know is, is very strong. So whether it's working together with major powers or whether it's working together with other actors, I think major powers do have a vested interest in this and they do have the resources um, and, and hopefully commitment to towards such cooperation. This is also positive. I'm loving it. Caroline, please. Uh, look, I really like Sarah's point about, about using minilaterals or smaller groupings as ginger groups. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's, that's something very valuable that they can do. Um, uh, look, I, th I think, you know, multilateralism is up to us. It's up to the member states to, to, to make it work. Uh, and so I, I see it very important for countries like Australia to work with others to promote the, 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 the rules-based order, to promote the kind of system that we want. It is very challenging. There is no question about that. Um, but perhaps I'm a little bit optimistic as well. I think it is possible to work with countries. I think there are, there are some big players that overplay their hand and you can see a bit of a reaction against that in ways that are actually not entirely un unhelpful to us. Um, I think it's in incumbent on us to put forward really strong candidates to run these multilateral institutions and to back each other in with those candidates uh, and, and to work very hard uh, to promote the outcomes in these forums that we want. It is, I have to say, it is really hard work. Having run major multilateral campaigns, they are very hard work to run. They're very resource intensive. It's hard work to get outcomes in multilateral forums because at any point you have a huge disparity in political objectives, economic development that creates different tensions in the system. And now you have the geopolitical challenges as well. So I just think it's incumbent on us to work all the time for renewal and reform. Um, I'm not in favour of big, huge processes to do that in the UN. They tend to become a, a, a sort of a, um, what's the word, a, a, a victim of their own processes. I, I remember in the 90s working on the never-ending reform of the UN system working groups in New York, and we just don't want to go back there. But I think, I think that sort of day-to-day -day renewal and trying to make organisations fit for purpose is just a very important way to proceed. Thanks. Thank you. Well, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, it could have been, I think, a somewhat depressing discussion, and I haven't found that at all. Um, I found those op opportunities for repair and renewal for, for doing the hard work of making multilateralism work. Um, certainly for a country like Australia, there's no real alternative. Um, we need to make multilateralism work. We need to have a rules-based international order that protects our interests. And um, I thank those who are trying their best to make that happen day in, day out. So if I can thank Caroline, thank Sarah, thank Hung and thank Thomas for their time, we really appreciate. I'd like to thank the organisers of this whole event. Um, so Richard Maud, who, uh, I'm glad he is still running, given all of this, all of that he's taken out of his system in making this happen, and to Lauren and to all the team that has made this possible. Now, we'll just have a quick break now. I think it's just about a, a 10 minute break. Um, so go and get yourself um, a drink, whatever break you need, um, but do come back for the final session if you can. Uh, one of the things about the Crawford Forum is it's a whole palace full of discussions and you can't attend them all. The final session is a great way to hear about some of the sessions you weren't able to come to and get a sense of the feel overall. So thank you again to our speakers, to our audience members, and look forward to seeing you in that final session. <laughs>